All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much for joining us for the fourth uh, session in our series of IBP implementations, what it really takes to move from APO to IBP. Uh, a couple of things we're going to do today is go through some introductions. We're lucky enough to have an actual real live client, um, one of the best optimizer supply network planning professionals I've ever had the privilege to work with, Maggie Dunn of McCain Foods. Uh, Maggie's been a great friend and client of ours for quite a long time um, and done just an amazing job in managing their transition through multiple iterations of planning tools. So she's going to share her journey there. Um, also along for the ride is Pat Green and myself um, from SCM Connections. Uh, I'll give my background quickly first. I've been in the supply chain planning space for about just shy of 20 years now. I've um, been working in APO in production planning and network planning for most of that. Um, focused on now recently focused on um, network architecture and actually system design with SCM Connections, where I've been here uh, after about probably eight years now. Uh, Pat, do you give, want to give a quick background and then we'll let Maggie share hers? Sure. Uh, Pat Green uh, from SCM Connections. I've been doing supply chain uh, planning and supply chain software with SAP for about 20 years now uh, in the uh, production planning detailed scheduling space as well as uh, network planning, um, demand planning, and then obviously with integrated business planning. Um, you know, and my, how I got involved with uh, with the McCain project was originally doing the PPDS side of it, which is, is still live um, as part of not the supply chain, not the supply network side, but PPDS and kind of doing a lot of the remediation um, after their uh, soon after their go live. So know a lot about the um, their design. So looking forward to uh, this should be a really good session today, and uh, looking forward to it. Cool. And Maggie, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, nice to be here. Um, I've spent about uh, 15 years in supply chain after my career. Uh, my background, uh, studied mathematics at University of Illinois. Uh, from there, I actually worked in supply chain for ArcelorMittal uh, steel manufacturing. And most recently, I've been at McCain Foods uh, for the past eight years, um, where I've overseen multiple transitions between different planning tools over the years and um, have had the pleasure of working with uh, Mike and Pat on a couple of those. So uh, happy to be here and uh, look forward to it. No, thanks. Uh, again, just housekeeping for those that have joined lately. If you have um, questions, go ahead and use that chat feature in the GoToWebinar app and we'll go ahead and answer them there. So what we're going to do is get into some of the um, digital supply chain planning architecture. So from the McCain point of view, we're going to walk through uh, some high level, just um, just some ground ground setting um, elements about what the what the implementation actually entailed before we get into some of the questions and answers around what that actually happened and then some best practices as well. So um, just I'll give my take and then Maggie, you can kind of see where you guys are at with it. But in the original project that started in 2017, and it focused on demand, inventory, SNOP, and the time series component of response and supply. And we went ahead and integrated that with APO as well as ECC. So there, there was um, quite a few applications going back and forth there. Um, and Maggie, those are all still being used today, what, three years later now, right? I hope. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So, so you're... Your involvement of it was, um, and we'll get into some of the actual process around it, but but all of these work well with the ECC Foundation. Um, again, we've moved the demand planning and the supply network planning out of APO, and the production planning and detail scheduling still resides there today, as well as some S&P. But if we talk about, again, this transformation strategy, specifically how it related to the McCain Foods implementation, um, you guys were doing all of this work in APO originally with um, sort of, you guys call, do you call it SNOP? Everybody has a little different name for their monthly planning process. Uh, yeah, when we were all out of, um, out of APO, we called it SNOP. Uh, but, and we did do our demand planning as well as supply planning uh, for our longer term. So anywhere from like the zero period to 24 months was all housed out of um, APO, 
Uh, however, we did not have any sort of inventory optimization module that existed within APO that we leveraged. Okay, so th and that was new functionality that you had. Mm -hmm. And then today you're still running some components of APO as well for execution planning, right? Yeah, um, we actually currently have an open project that we're working through. Uh, where we're truly trying to integrate the, the two systems to where APO is only used for detailed scheduling. Okay. And then um, one question always comes up is you're working with ECC today. Is there an S4 project on the roadmap at all or did that way into any of your um, planning decisions so far or is that still pretty out there in the roadmap? Um, I know it's being discussed. Uh, we didn't take that into account at least for any of our, our current projects. Okay, so still with ECC. So specifically, this was a, a summary of the project that I found from, from 2018 that went back in there. Um, Maggie, maybe you can talk through a little bit about each one of these and sort of the goal of each one. I know there was some new capabilities, um, some aspirational capabilities, and so I thought it'd be an interesting journey to start with sort of why the project was approved to begin with and what sort of um, advantages you were anticipating when we first started? Sure. So um, for demand planning, really what we were looking to do was to move the activities as well as reporting out of APO and into IVP. Um, that one was um, somewhat straightforward in the sense that we already had that level of detail uh, accounted for in APO. Uh, and that we wanted to make sure that that same information was now transported into IVP. Uh, when we get to the network supply planning though, um, that was really where we were looking for the additional functionality. Um, there were some drawbacks at the time, but uh, for our network supply planning, what we wanted to be able to do uh, was actually see customer level forecast um, at a location node which we could not do in APO. Um, and then we also wanted to be able to have more robust reporting when it came to what our supply planning sourcing plans and inventory projections look like. Uh, one of the other big features that we wanted uh, was around scenario planning. Although APO um, technically has that functionality, we had a very difficult time of building in any of the what if scenarios that we wanted to be able to take into account from a planning perspective and actually pull the output and do a comparison side by side. Um, one of our other areas um, that we wanted to work through was actually having real costs um, and penalty costs in our optimizer. Um, although we had that in APO, when we transitioned to an APO optimizer, it was extremely clunky, very hard to manage, difficult to upkeep. Um, and so one of the benefits with IDP was actually having cost information easy to access from a reporting standpoint out of IDP uh, that you loaded into the system. Um, Inventory optimization. Um, we had ad hoc reporting that we did outside of any sort of planning tool to come up with targeted safety stock values. However, what we wanted to do was actually integrate that to be part of our planning process and have it all under one planning area. So for inventory optimization, um, that was really new for us actually to have it um, in a system as opposed to just in an Excel sheet for us. Um, that's also worked out very well. And then the operational supply planning. Um, although we had that on our list of activities that we wanted, um, that functionality really wasn't available when we were going live. It was on the roadmap. Um, so we did not um, get into any sort of order series level information. That's why today actually at McCain, we still have APO in addition to IVP. Um, we still do our order series level planning out of APO and use IVP planning for our longer term 
um, like three months to 36 month horizon. Yeah, and I think that's sort of fairly common now for those that have APO still is to leverage that. Um, and if you look at the timeline that we did this in, I mean, it seemed like a lot at the time, and I think looking back and looking at the project plan, we got all of this done in just under 12 months, um, which was very, I would say aggressive, <laughs> but it worked um, and, and went in and, and is utilized. So I think that's a huge credit to you and the entire McCain team. You just got nominated to talk about it today. So, so I think this kind of shows some of the, the platform that you worked with. And, and I would say, um, and, and Pat, I think you can back me up on this too. This sort of project scope and, and flow diagram is fairly common for those that have APO. So if you look at it, right, this sort of traces your, what well, you were just talking through, Megs, where you said, okay, your APO to DP to IBP, um, not only did it have demand planning, but you also had other demand signals that you brought in for consensus demand, and then you pushed that forecast out the door. Um, you know, one of the benefits there being, if you remember having to deal with the CVCs and the release cycle of APO, I mean, that alone was a huge advantage to be able to do that sort of functionality. Um, any any comments on just sort of that alone and what it, was, what it took to get over? You said it's pretty straightforward, but if a lot of times you forget how cumbersome that CVC structure is and sort of limitations around the release process that you used to have. Um, yeah, so I, I would say one of the caveats with it, though, um, uh, for us, we had never really maintained uh, customer sourcing relationships other than what was in ECC and demand planning could create those CVCs and forecasts on something that didn't necessarily exist in ECC. That was a big learning for us when we transitioned into uh, IBP. We were fairly um, we had gone through our APO optimizer uh, previously. So on the supply side, we had stumbled upon gaps in our ECC data uh, ahead of time. Introducing the customer sourcing node for us uh, was brand new, and I don't think we necessarily realized the amount of master data that we needed to clean up in order to have um, all of the information translate well over into IBP. Um, but what I will say is um, one of the benefits today, now that we have cleaned up a lot of that, um, is we actually can very quickly tell when we have a gap um, from a demand planning perspective. When we were in APO, I think we had all the same issues that we were seeing uh, when we cut over to IBP. We just couldn't actually see them well on the supply side. All of our forecasts were just at a location node. And so we didn't necessarily notice when customer level forecasting wasn't coming over as expected. Uh, whereas an IDP, you can see it. Uh, and so you can actually fix it. So that, that was, um, I think the team initially felt like there was this onslaught of information that wasn't clean. Uh, but but for us, it was actually, it was always like that, but now we have visibility to the problem and we can fix it. So uh, that is one of the learnings in general, I'd say, with IDP is it, um, it exposes if your data isn't maintained well, um, which is a good thing, you can clean it up, but there is a certain amount of effort that goes into that. Now, I remember the customer node, specifically the customer sourcing, being a huge issue when we were going through it just because we were developing, I mean, for those who haven't seen it, IBP is a master data element that does map your actual customer product to a ship from location within um, the, the McCain network. And so is that something that has been an ongoing struggle or is that more just a project cleanup and then it was sort of in, embedded in the organization? Um, it was definitely a significant struggle for the first year. Um, from there, we we broke out an approach on how we could sort through our customer level data. Just for a little bit of background, one of our processes initially in ECC, when we would have a customer set up, they would get set up at multiple locations, even though they weren't necessarily valid locations. Um, and so what ended up happening is we had 
um, um, like a four to one ratio of customer nodes versus where they actually pulled from. And the data in ECC was never uh, properly maintained because they didn't actually need it in order to process orders correctly. So uh, what ended up happening though is we couldn't um, translate the location that those customers should be supplying from. Uh, so there was a bit of a project to figure out how to best go about it. We're still working through some of it, um, but we've tackled probably over 80% of it, which was the big the big stuff. Um, and right now we're working through what sort of slight configuration changes we want in the way that DPI is pulling our data in, um, in order to, to clean up that last 20%. Okay. I think that's a big one, especially as it sort of changed the level that you're working with. Um, so just just managing it is a, probably a, a big hurdle for a lot of companies. And then going into that as well was your inventory optimization. I mean, you mentioned before there were some spreadsheets that you were using, I believe, um, to taking on something that doesn't exist in APO. Was that something that was immediately um, you know, leveraged by the organization, or is that something that took some time to be able to absorb and, and utilize effectively? Um, we were able to leverage it fairly quickly. I think it was within the year of going live. Um, we were able to to work through that. Um, we did, I would, I would recommend for anyone that's doing a inventory optimization to take a bit of a stair-step approach uh, typically, optimizers can can recommend something that might be just too big of a leap to make in the short term for inventory reduction. Um, so we took a much more stair-stepped approach to say, you know, even if it recommends you know, a 50% reduction in inventory that you could get by with, you know, at max do 20% or something to that effect. Um, and so, so with that, since we took a stair step approach, it was very easy for us to roll that in year one um, because it wasn't a drastic change to the network. The other thing that was very beneficial with IO is that although in our total inventory requirements came down, it did increase inventory requirements on products that needed to be increased on. So you had some products that came down, whereas other products increased. Um, which I also think gave a little bit more validity to maybe people who aren't used to optimizers, uh, that it doesn't always just recommend reductions on everything. It also recommends increases on inventory for products where you have high variability, high volatility, and that you should be holding more inventory on. Yeah, that, that's a, a hard to understand, I think, for a lot of people. And I remember some slides you had originally where you had optimal inventory like here's what the perfect world looks like and then here's what we're shooting for um so to set the expectation that it you know there's the mathematical optimal level of these tools but that doesn't necessarily always mean something that you should go after right right uh, reality intervenes and just because the answer comes out isn't necessarily um what you need to do um, yeah and i think you kind of mike just to kind of to, to belabor that point i mean there is a your when you first turn on the math will turn out a number from you know the optimizer um, especially on the inventory side and your your organization may not be prepared your your inventory analyst may be prepared to understand what that number is but the organization may not be prepared to really uh, absorb it and that stair step approach has been um, I, I would say critical for for just about any inventory optimization uh, project just because there takes some time to really understand what the the optimizer is giving you and the, the numbers that it's spitting out and, and mm -hmm. it takes time for your organization to kind of wrap its head around it so uh, i think that was uh, I'm, I'm sure it was made things a lot easier and, and mitigated the risk but also helped the organization get around it so not the only yeah. client to work through that well that's something yeah, and that's something, especially as you went into your network optimizer, which was sort of your your pet on this project to see that one through. Um, I think this is sort of where I, I want to really explore your experience because this is the second SAP optimizer that we um, implemented with you. The first one being uh, APO, and then the second one being IVP. So I think there's a couple of um, 
a couple of things. First of all, let's talk about um, just an optimizer in general, right? In terms of what to expect. You know, there, there's a lot of data, it's still rare. Um, one of the things that we get from a lot of people that haven't done this before is optimizers are a black box and I can't, I can't ever figure it out. So from somebody that's figured it out, what are some just sort of overall best practices when looking at an optimization engine to go after? Yeah, so I guess I would say I um, I agree with that sentiment of struggling to figure it out um, if you have zero reporting or scenario ability. Uh, that was, I think, one of our biggest drawbacks with APO. Um, for me personally, um, you know, I never trust the optimizer results until I can understand the logic that helps drive it. And in APO, it was very difficult to actually understand, you know, if I change field A to this number, what does that then drive as an output? Uh, for IVP, it's very simple to do that. Um, it's also repeatable, uh, which is another thing um, that for me is important. Uh, you should be able to run your optimizer with the exact same constraints um and get the same answer and shouldn't change um even if it's just maybe reshuffling a couple very low volume items you should still be getting the same answer so for idp one of the things that was most beneficial was was the amount of reporting uh and how easy it is to manipulate data in a planning view that was i think for me one of the biggest changes um, you could do very quick side by sides. Um, it doesn't take hours to pull data and then load it into another spreadsheet to have a pivot table that you can compare against what you had last month. All of it is just within Excel and you can pull key figures in. Um, I would also, uh, being someone that was on that's on the business, um, I've always been involved with the optimizer like design and configuration like for IBP I was. And I do think that that's very beneficial to have a business representative on a project to actually understand the way that the optimizers work and that it doesn't just kind of come from your IT group and get passed over to the business. Um, there's an inherent like ownership and accountability uh, when you actually help get to design um, what you want it to accomplish. I would say the other part of it for an optimizer uh, depending on your level of experience, um, don't try to go from zero to 100 on your first optimizer. Uh, and I think IBP set up well for that, where you can layer in various levels of constraints. Uh, I know when we first started our project, we had a huge list of things that we wanted to be taken into account. And realistically, some of those we had never planned before. Um, so we had to peel that back a bit and look say okay i want to replicate what i have today or something similar to what i have today and then maybe try to look ahead a year or two where you might want to be um but don't if you're not used to planning don't try to go from planning um feel close to nothing to every possible constraint under the moon uh to have that taken into account in your optimizer it's just it will end up being something that you don't understand or that is a black box because there's too many different levers and constraints that could be uh, conflicting with one another or driving a weird solution. So I do think that there's, similar to the IO, start stair stepping, um, do, do a bit piecemeal. Yeah, that's something I really appreciate about your approach when you work through it is, um, I remember working through spreadsheets with you one at a time, adding one constraint at a time and seeing what happens. And it, it's a bit methodical. But um, I think the results go for it. And, and one thing I just want to talk about, too, is the team structure. I mean, you mentioned having somebody on the business for it. Um, what if you're building that organization now, if you're going into it like a supply network optimizer, either an IP, an IBP, for example, to support an SNOP process, um, what is what team does that look like like where do, where do you see them sitting and then what sort of skill sets do you think that needs to be successful and then 
how much time does that person dedicate as well? Yeah. Um, okay. So I think, you know, that's, that's a great question. I think that there's a lot of different you know, answers depending on, um, you know, whatever team you have or skill set available to you. Um, so I, I do think that, um, like for me, for my team, I have two full-time people that run our optimizers for different networks um, as part of our monthly IBP planning cycle. Um, um, so they're typically involved in any sort of project that we have related on IBP. Um, ultimately, like the business users are running it very like, iteratively. Um, we run it every month and so we run it. Our different networks could be run anywhere from like 50 to 100 times a month, just with little cleanups or tweaks or scenarios, and they run very quickly. Um, so you need a business user that actually understands how your optimizer works. Um, I do think that from a technical uh, approach, the skill set can vary. Um, it is beneficial to at least have one person on the team, I would say, that has a technical understanding of the way your optimizer runs. Um, one of the things that's been a struggle for us as we've transitioned from APO to IBP is that it's not um, it's not like standard IT functionality where if you run if you correctly fill out steps or boxes steps one two three four five that when you run it you will get the right answer um, you can you can input the correct uh, input valid figures into any of those steps and your optimizer could still fail because you're entering conflicting information. So you do want a business user that can comprehend, understand, and do some of that root cause analysis. Um, I would say on the flip side, uh, one of our, I would say, downsides that we didn't necessarily take into account when we first went live is although the business can have um, a lot of say in the way that the configuration is done for IVP, you do need to have um, your IS and IT groups well represented to help carry um, your IDP uh, tool forward down the road uh, in order to be able to make any sort of configuration changes, also diagnose uh, any issues when you run into them. Um, so you need a combination depending on the, the level of skill set that you have on your team. But you definitely need someone that has I would recommend someone in the business that has a technical understanding of how optimizers run beyond just basic supply planning. Yeah, and that that's something I think that you don't want to find out too late is the organizational and technical commitment to it. It's not something that's easily plug and play, as you said. If you're going to actually leverage this in the overall planning process, it's something that needs to be supported as such and sort of be integrated into your job. Um, kind of going on that, so the next question I had is, is what is now a day in the life or a month in the life, I guess, from where you said, look like using IVP? Um, and then where do you guys see the most value out of that from the tool set? And then where have you um, still need to put some effort into it, whether it's a tool or the process to, to come out ahead? Yeah, um, okay, so I'd say for day in the life, so right now we're still leveraging IBP just for our monthly uh, planning cycle. So every month we get a new demand plan. Um, we update any sort of capacities, rate information, and then um, we project out for the next you know, 24 to 36 months how much production inventory um, issues we might have. So, um, we probably spend the first two to three days after our forecast pass still cleaning up uh, master data issues. Uh, we, have, we haven't done any work in IVP since we went live, which was close to four years ago, um, any sort of massive work. Um, I would recommend one of my learnings is to plan after you go live 
that every year you'll want some level of like enhancement or upkeep. Um, so we're doing that now, uh, which is great. So that'll free up two to three days um, a month of just manual maintenance or updates of data um, going forward. Uh, a lot of those things you just don't necessarily have the scope or the bandwidth in your first project to figure out exactly where in ECC you want to pull that data from or exactly how it's going to work in your new optimizer um, planning tool. So they were the right things to deprioritize at the time, but now that we're actually, you know, I would say elevated our planning, uh, we need to go back and actually figure out how to automate that so that way my team's time could be better used scenario planning as opposed to uh, fixing master data issues. Uh, so I'd say we do two to three days on that. It really only takes us one to two days to complete a baseline outlook. And then um, typically days five, six, and seven, uh, we're doing different scenarios or taking into account um, any sort of other maybe supply issues that we might be aware of or sensitivities that we want to do. What happens if demand keeps escalating at 10% for the next couple months. What happens if supply is short by 5%? Um, they're really easy and to And are you using scenarios for that? Are you using the yeah. scenarios to support them? Yeah, it's very easy. Um, I would say besides um, so myself for my team, um, no one else on my team has any sort of you know, robust optimizer uh, background. They all have been in planning for a while, but um, it's very easy for a business user to make adjustments in a scenario. We can easily increase the forecast. We can easily reduce supply. It doesn't take any sort of like background configuration to understand. It's it's an Excel, and you you know you multiply the forecast by 1.1. It's uh so all of those scenario plannings. It it makes it so much easier. Um, and so that's why I'm really looking forward to our project that will be tackling a lot of the the, the manual side that we still do today, because uh, that'll really open up the door for how quickly we can we can run different scenarios. And then um, I think your last question was around the tool. Um, I think for like I said um, earlier, uh, it goes back to um, ideally we would have had another project sooner that would clean up a lot of the master data maintenance or key figure maintenance that we do um, today we it was very it was somewhat easy once we got going on our optimizer uh, how quickly we were able to progress in terms of maturity on it and unfortunately we just didn't have some of the maintenance piece of it already it wasn't at that same level of maturity so we're going back now to clean up and um, just source data from ECC uh, instead of having someone like transport it over uh, every month, and that'll free up a lot of time. Thanks. Yeah, that's a pretty robust process. Um, one of the things that I think you probably take for granted, you you kind of glanced on it, but if you remember back to the old days with APO, is the financialization of IBP. Um, I think one thing McCain has done above and beyond anything I've seen is the um, the ways that you're able to split out costs as well as project some of the pricing as well. Um, for those that aren't used to that environment or doing it offline, can you kind of walk through some of how the organization has used that and some of the analysis you're able to do that maybe wasn't possible before? Yeah. Um, so we use a blend of real costs. Um, manufacturing or transportation um, as well as penalty costs to help drive our optimizer. Um, so penalty cost is like tricking your model into saying that you must fulfill customer forecast, even though obviously it costs money to, to make that product. Mm -hmm. um, um, we, we had done a lot of work leading up to our IBP project and various other projects on building out what our manufacturing costs or transportation costs look like. Uh, so I will say that that's a really good starting point. Um, 
if we had not done a lot of that work for various other projects, I think it would have been very difficult um, for us to actually build in more robust cost reporting. Um, so if you if you haven't done that yet, um, you would, I th before you even got into IBC, you'd want to figure out whether or not you plan to use real costs or penalty costs for everything. You know, I, I've never done that, but I'm aware you know, other people will use directional costs to help gauge production requirements or transportation requirements. Um, we took a different approach. We're actually using real costs. The downside of that is there's master data upkeep that goes with it as you add new products into your portfolio or you add new um, warehouses into your network or new freight lanes. Um, all of those have to be kept up with it. You can't maintain production costs for 80% of the products in your model. You have to maintain whatever level of costing you do. You have to do it for every single product that's in your network. Um, so that's an example of master data today that we manually update and that we're actually building logic to pull it directly out of ECC. Um, that was too complex for the first project. Um, what it has done though is it's, it's really helped us when we project out that we want to make a network sourcing move for whatever reason or we want to do something different. Um, all of our costs are at the click of a button, so it makes it very easy. Um, it also is a good way to, to validate um, any of your inputs. So like I said earlier, it's really easy to extract information out of IBP. So we, we even have a process where you know, we share all of our cost data that we have in our model with our finance team, and there's a, a level of rigor then that ensures that we're using the information that they want us to use. That way when we propose something, um, it doesn't have that black box feeling. They can see the cost as well and whether or not there's a benefit or a hurt based off of what we're recommending. Um, that's been very helpful, um, especially as costs have changed um, drastically over the last um, year. Yeah, I bet. I think it has for everybody too. Um, Pat, do you have any questions that you wanted to go through? Yeah, Maggie, I think the one thing that, um, you know, that you said earlier was kind of the approach um, that you kind of built upon from when you first started off with the optimizer, you know, keeping it simple and kind of working through the costs and trying not to boil the ocean. We see that a lot with other clients. Um, it, it just because, you know, what we find is the planners want to throw everything at it and then kind of let the optimizer sort out what the, what the cost would be and, or sorry, what the, what the solution should be and kind of, can you take a little bit more time and talk about your approach and kind of how, how you guys went through it? Because I think that's really, really critical. Cause I, what we see, and Mike can kind of back me up on this, is that a lot of users just want to throw, you know, they want to solve for everything as opposed to the 80% where you can get a good solve. And then, you know, you're it's good enough as opposed to every single exception. So kind of, if you can kind of comment on that and kind of your approach and, and, and how you found that that worked for, for McCain. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely um, a back and forth. Uh, from my point of view, it's it's rough cut capacity planning. So, um, and you you want to be able to turn over scenarios and plans quickly. So, I don't want a model that um, takes 15 hours to run. That doesn't um, that doesn't meet our need, which is more around um, like sensitivity planning for longer term. What if your costs change? What if um, you know? your production capacity is is constrained what if your demand goes up or down um now with that being said we also have a level of detail that we want included in our plan um i think for us it was parsing out um how important or how impactful you think that that is for your plan um and whether or not i, I do think that there's some credence to whether or not you do it today if you don't do it today um, there's, there could be a reason why you don't do it today. It's complex or it's challenging or you have to reference different things and to figure out, um, you know, why, why that is. 
Um, so like one for us, I know for sure we wanted minimum production requirements. Uh, that was something um, that I know that we wanted originally. Uh, we ended up tabling that until later. Uh, we didn't actually have that functionality in our um, plans anyways. Uh, we knew that it does impact something, uh, but we felt that there was lower in the priority in terms of like the big picture. And we know that whenever you put a minimum on something, it tends to um, really increase your solve times. So we felt that once we became slightly better with our planning, that that was something that we would come back around to and figure out how to integrate into our plan. Um, so that's where we're at today, you know, looking at how we build that into our current supply plans. Um, you know, if you're looking for the other piece of it is, you know, the level of detail that you want to solve for how far out in the future. So, you know, our demand is as good as we think it's going to be, but, um, you know, realistically, how accurate is month 18 for one particular SKU, one particular customer to where you need to be building the most constraining factors on your plan um, to solve for something out there. Um, you know, volume-wise, the volume might be fairly representative, but the level of granularity might not be there in order for you to actually be executing a constraint at that level of detail. So those are some of the you know, the inputs you have to weigh. I think, I think that's something a lot of people fall in the trap of is what matters and when does it matter? Um, you confuse the solution that you need to make a decision with, um, you know, <laughs> with a complex math problem. Being a math major, I think you appreciate the difference there. It's like, is we month 19, 20 really all that impactful? Are we going to change anything that we've done? If you think about 20 months ago, you know, is anything that you would have assumed relevant today? Not really, um, but you. But it is a directional, and, and there's that funnel of decision making of you know things get more impactful and more real as you get in closer. And so, don't let perfect be the enemy of a, a good solution that'll get you to tomorrow. Um, no, that was a good one. And that brings me to one question though on reporting. So I know that's one thing that sort of varies very widely from client to client. What did you end up doing for sort of reporting and digesting all the information that comes out of IBP that you've been talking about um, in the past 45 minutes or so? Um, yeah, so every month, so we um, say it's twofold. So every month we have a supply consensus and demand consensus and, you know, uh, financial reconciliation and uh, MBR. So we have the different stages of an IVP cycle. Those tend to be very slide focused, church focused. Um, so it was, it took us a little bit of time to figure out what we wanted to share out. I would say that's one of the pitfalls that you could get stuck in with IVP is you've probably never had so much key figure data available to you. Um, and at lots of different levels of granularity. Um, so aligning on what it is you plan to report out on. And you should also think about that when you're going through your um, IVP project, if you're going live, like what ideally, what are your key outputs that you want to share um, every month in terms of like a presentation, if you have a IVP process. And then the flip side at the detailed level. So we share Excel files, uh, production plans at a SKU level, month level, location level, um, projected distribution, projected um, you know, uh, constrained forecast to you. Um, we also can do different units of measure. That was a big thing for us, um, whether it's in pounds or in pounds. Yep. Um, so we have it's kind of split into two into two groups. We have the detailed information that's very Excel based. All of our templates are set up. We make them once, which is so nice, and then you you just refresh it. Um, so there's no more like an APO. You have to pull all of your planned production, and it came in mm -hmm. a weird like CSV file, and then you'd have to cut you it over. It and you, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so there's none of that, <laughs> which is great. Um, it's, it's really just, we have, um, so I will say that that's led to more files because you just open and you refresh the tab and it all, and it refreshes all of the same filtered information that you had selected beforehand. But it's really easy. We have a lot of data now that we pull and we just save. And we keep in our folders um, for future reference. If something comes up looking for some sort of detailed information that we didn't have uh, or that we didn't have to share out. Um, but we sell, we send out Excel templates um, every month that has that level of detail. And then we have another folder which contains um, like IVP templates that also have um, another tab in there where you can do like the lookups or create your own chart. However, it is you want to manipulate the data. Um, and we use those for our, our monthly PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Also super easy. Sort of a mix. Yeah. So um, we have some best practice. Pat, is there any other questions you had for Maggie before we go into our best practices for projects? Yeah, that was the one that, you know, just kind of helping you know, understanding the how to how to get that strike the balance between, you know, that Goldilocks approach of, hey, what, I'm getting enough information on here. I'm getting a good solve, but I'm not trying to, you know, go down to the nth level of detail. And I think you're kind of exactly right, Maggie. We find, you know, do you need a seven hour solve? If it's going to take you seven hours to get there, then, um, you know, you can only do one a day. Well, if you're doing scenario based planning and you want to run three or four, that doesn't really help. You know, so those are the kind of considerations that we see in our projects where, again, it's, you know, from your experience, what you're seeing is, you know, a lot of the planners want to want to solve everything. And it's like, well, let's focus on what's what really matters and, um, you know, and get a good solve that we can actually reproduce and utilize. So thanks for that. So, so one of the things you brought up in our pre-meeting, Maggie, was data integrity was a huge deal. And so you talked a little bit about the customer master. How is your organization set up to sort of manage new products or new customers that come in? Uh, how formal is that practice? And how do you tell if you are dropping anything? Yeah, um, so I do think that overall we had a, um, we already had structure in place that supported master data. Um, whether it what does that team look like? Well, um, so for APO, I had someone on my team that was in, that was in charge of data coordinator uh, for APO. Um, ECC has the whole data governance team around product setup um, that my team would be involved in to be prepared for when it flowed over into APO. But I had a dedicated person that all that they did was keep up APO data. Um, that was their full-time job. So when we moved into IVP, our long-term expectation was that at some point APO maintenance would go away um, and that all it would be is IVP. Well, we've been living in this world now for a couple of years where we have both, we have to be maintaining APO and IVP. So um, other, the business users that actually run the optimizer, they've picked up more of the slack in terms of keeping our uh, data maintenance up to date in IVP. I would recommend uh, for anyone that's thinking about transitioning to IVP, uh, if you don't have like a data coordinator or someone like that today, um, you should expect to have a data coordinator that oversees your master data, even if it's just to clean up errors or make changes, um, depending on where you're sourcing your data from as well. Um, so we have had, um, since we had a data coordinator on an APO, um, we at least had a, a decent amount of knowledge and experience as to where data resides in ECC, where it resides in APO, um, which made it easier for us to pull data into IDP. Um, however, as time has progressed and we've realized that we need to link and source more data out of ECC, um, we have realized that some of our data is, is not as clean as what we want, or maybe there just isn't a thorough understanding in the business of how that data works. So. Um, that's required 
that's required more work, lots of interaction from the business, lots of testing. Um, you have to make sure that the data that flows over from your source systems are correct um, and that you understand why they're there and why, why they came over and what you're missing. Cool. Yeah, I think that's something too that it's not just a project role, right? It is, an, I mean, there is focus on data on the project, but it, there, there's always new data, there's always changes, and it's important to keep yeah. that up to go forward. Um, the other one you mentioned is continuous improvement, and I think you're, you called that out specifically because you guys did not account for this as much as you would have preferred. Um, do you want to talk about sort of that structure in what you would recommend if you were going back uh, to wrap a project up again? Yeah. Um, so one of the um, so one of the areas is around just ongoing support. I think I mentioned earlier that IVP is not like APO to where you know you create a design, the business approves it, and it's good to go. And as long as it doesn't break, you're fine. Um, IVP is different um, in the sense that. Hopefully, as you're optimizing more and more, you're improving your planning maturity um, and that you're going to want more out of the system. Um, it's, I'll say from the business side, it's, it's easy enough to configure in the sense that you can, you know, um, like we're working with SCM to add on additional constraints that now we want to take into account into our model um, because we we've kind of, we've progressed enough on production planning side, inventory planning. We want to make sure that now we're, we're able to take into account transportation planning, for example. Um, so it's not that our model wasn't uh, doing what it was supposed to earlier, but we're ready now to take on more constraints or different levels of scenario planning. We don't want to automate data, or we want to automate data more and spend less time uh, manually maintaining something. Uh, in my mind, what we should have done was um, allocated like a budget or time every year um, that would help us do smaller iterations as opposed to needing now like a project team support a larger enhancement project. Uh, whereas if you build it into just part of your ongoing yearly planning cycle, um, it's easy to pick up small changes that have big effects for your team um, and also to, yeah. to keep moving your planning along. It seems to be a theme to, for the success overall is that this is not like a, a simple upgrade project, but it's a continuous improvement and from a couple ways. One is just to keep the data and system up to speed and up to par that's, that's required, but also as your business changes, to be able to adapt that system so it doesn't work for what you used to be, it works for what you're going to be, uh, just requires yeah. a dedicated team to do so and the resources on the existing team to commit to it. Yeah, and I would say the other thing that it prevents is all of those ad hoc Excel reports that are typically generated oh, yeah. in a business because the system doesn't take something into account. And so you have these other offline either attributes or formulas that someone's doing. Um, if you do in a project every year, it takes that whole element out of it if you do it correctly. Keeps people in the system, keeps the investment going, things like that. Cool. Well, that is that wraps up our session, Maggie. This was awesome as always. Um, great story, great results, and really just an amazing um, an amazing uh, story that you have for McCain and for um, for IBP in general. Uh, one thing that we're, we're going to continue this with is we're doing an in-person event. Not you, but SCM Connections is doing an in-person event in Atlanta later this month or in um, December, where we'll go through some some more in-depth workshops, some in-depth um, discussion on how to actually migrate from APO to IBP, what that might look like for you, and what are the um, what are those success factors. So kind of bringing everything in this four-part webinar together. And that would be Wednesday, December 8th in Atlanta. But in the meantime, um, Maggie, we thank you very much for your time, for sharing your story, for inviting us into your home to, to show us uh, what it takes for an IVP project to be successful. 
And um, with that, thank you and enjoy the rest of your week, everybody. Thanks a lot, Maggie. Thank you. Yeah, take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye.